It's the 17th of June 2021 and you're watching Curiously Polar. And we're back with yet another episode of our wonderful show about everything. Uh, oh no, all things north and south. Right? Hi Henry, how are you? I'm <laughs> great, how are you? <laughs> Good. Um, yeah, I think the title already gave it away. We are at um, at a bit of a a new thing in this show because uh, <laughs> so, someone is back. And uh, let me bring him on the screen just to say hello to Mario Aguarone. How are you, Mario? I'm doing great. And especially because I'm back here on Curious <laughs> Polar and uh, I'm meeting Henry for the first time. Same here, same here. And I'm glad you're back. <laughs> so let me let me try to... Okay, no, I think... There, there's probably a lot of people who have uh, listened to the, this podcast from the beginning, so they will all be going, "Yay, Mario's back!" <laughs> and then there are, and then there are, finally uh, he's back. <laughs> finally he's back, and we don't have to see Henry anymore. No, um, and then there is a bunch of people who are very likely um, new and have no idea who this guy is on the screen or in their earphones. So, uh, Mario. Give us a quick rundown. Give introduce yourself as if this was the first time you are on this show. <laughs> as if, yes. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction and no pressure on me, of course. <laughs> no, of yes. course not. It's all about yeah. you now. <laughs> yeah, I am. Uh, I am Mario. Mario Aquarone, and uh, I've been deciding early on to be a passionate about the sea, or oh, maybe it was just an inspiration. And I followed my studies as a naturalist, as a biologist, especially following whales, seals, walruses. And this has brought me to uh, Denmark, Greenland, to Norway, to the Arctic, and then further to the Antarctic. I, uh, when I met uh, Chris, I was at a stage uh, in my life where I, where I was uh, focusing mostly on expedition cruising. So I was expedition leader. We met on a uh, ship. Shortly, we met on a ship on the Norderlicht yep. up in uh, Svalbard. That was a few years back. And uh, we started also the Curiosity Polar, thanks to Chris's inspiration here. And uh, after a few episodes, I uh, I moved to Iceland. And, uh, and that was a very curious and very interesting experience being in Iceland. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Paul, Henry, Henry knows about Iceland, yes. Yeah. And, uh, and then a few, uh, a few months later, I got an offer to uh, become a full-time expedition leader for Hurtiruten. And that was in 2018. And I started uh, there in the uh, spring 2018, uh, actually cruising around Iceland and uh, then going down to Antarctic and up and down again. And this made it very difficult to uh, follow up on the Curiously Polar. Uh, yes, stuff. we know. But um, <laughs> yeah, and we know. And this was uh, really, really bad of my part, of course, but uh, it was very difficult to, uh, to keep up with this uh, at the quality that uh, would have uh, would have satisfied you listening and uh, of course my colleagues here and fortunately henry was uh, ready to step in that was really <laughs> nice i'm grateful the replacement and, uh, mario <laughs> yeah yes and uh and then thanks to the uh covid situation or maybe uh even before that a few a few months before i uh, i set uh, my uh Siemens sack uh, down here in Tromsø again and uh, started working for the uh, Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program, which is a working group within the Arctic Council. So I took up an office job. So we, and have, that an, was, we have an uh, inside perspective now. Um, but yeah, but I think almost. <laughs> we, we have to say you are not here in any capacity as an official kind of uh, spokesperson or anything for not, the Arctic Council. So Not at all. Not at all. I uh, and I would not be able, uh, even in my professional situation, I wouldn't be speaking for the Arctic Council. I mean, uh, professionally, I'm a, a deputy secretary for the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program, which is a working group under the Arctic Council, but is a Norwegian foundation. So uh, we are uh, kind of separate, and we are actually celebrating. Actually, a couple of days ago, uh, we were celebrating Monday on the 14th, the 30th anniversary of the AMAP. Uh, and um, which predates the Arctic Council, actually, and um, 
and so lots of interesting things happening but i am here as you say as a private person and uh, as a person that is terribly curious and uh, terribly interested about everything polar but also something in between if there and, is anything <laughs> and uh, one thing that new listeners might not know is that you are uh, by training you are a marine biologist yes i am i uh I uh, started studying whales uh, and dolphins in the Mediterranean during my master's that was uh, back in the early 90s and uh, continued on and uh, my PhD is on uh, walrus ecophysiology. Uh, I uh, tried to measure or estimate how much walruses eat over a year or need to eat over a year and um, that was my field work in East Greenland for three seasons and a couple of seasons later uh, Uh, as well for a few refinements and uh, and then I worked uh, when I moved here to Tromso I uh, moved because I was uh, hired as the scientific secretary for the North Atlantic Marine Mammal Commission where I was uh, serving in that position from 2007 to 2012. Awesome. So the, the, the marine biology perspective that we had uh, at the beginning of Uh, curiosity polar and that then went poof when Henry came on board <laughs> then not, it, not, it, not his fault no but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a great fan of this of this diversity of, uh, of uh, interests and expertise here because uh, Henry exactly. uh, volcanoes glaciers everything ice <laughs> not not to reduce you to just that but um, uh, that yeah, is lately also quite a lot of uh, geopolitics um, geopolitics what, what, What It's, certainly is missing, really, is um, like wildlife. Yes. Really. So yeah. I yeah. mean, the, the 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 show really has taken like different different uh, um, how do we say that uh, different ways, different turns different turn. over yeah. over the time, and uh, I think we have kind of become a bit more political, a bit more. Um, I wouldn't even say political, but a bit more looking at the environment, looking at climate, looking at other things there. Um, yeah, climate so, change is a, a recurring topic in, in, in all um, its facets. It's, uh, it's really difficult not to talk about climate change when you talk about the polar regions, <laughs> at so, least for uh, me. <laughs> by the way, uh, the sound that you're hearing in the background is um, in Tromsø, is, it's raining right now. And no, actually, that's in Transylvania. Oh, that's on, that's just in Transylvania. <laughs> But but you're right. It is raining drops as well. Where I'm. We he <laughs> here in, need that much. Here in Germany, we just have like uh, we we're, we're going to get 33 degrees today. So hmm. Celsius, that is. That's in the high. We're 90s. not that high. We're we're just at the. We're scratching at 30, but uh, it's raining at the same time. So it's a amazing <laughs> mixture for polar guides. Never mind. Yes, and here I'm. I'm just having a good time here with our <laughs> 10 degrees outside and. And my good 21, 22 inside the house. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, with that, we don't really have a, like a like a, a whole bunch planned today because we wanted to make this a fresh experience for everyone and just see how maybe maybe talk about a few topics. Before we do that, let's bring up the polar newsreel because we have a few things that we want to talk about from. Uh, things that happened in the last couple of weeks and um, let me see I have all new buttons here everything is new so <laughs> here we go um, we have uh, this one from the Arctic Council Arctic Council adopts first ever strategic plan this is from highnorthnews.com um, Henry you put this on here um, so what are we I did looking yeah at? Uh, I think very interesting um, to see um, I think like two years ago a bit more than two years ago we we started to um, follow the Arctic Council a little bit more closely on the last um, uh, change of the chairmanship and now in May Iceland actually um, yeah uh, forwarded the chairmanship to uh, to Russia and during the Arctic uh, Council meeting in uh, Reykjavik um, the state secretaries from all the members uh, were just participating in uh, Harpa down in the in the harbor, and um, we're talking about uh, the future plans of um, the Arctic Council, and um, they actually worked on a declaration. Uh, declaration, and uh, Mario probably can um, say a bit more about that. Well, uh, 
the declaration uh, that was approved here at the uh, at the biennial ministerial meeting the Arctic Council meets every year but uh, every second year there is a ministerial meeting where the Arctic ministers meet and uh, there is uh, uh, I would say most of the times there has been a declaration approved uh, previous time it was not and it was an exception actually two years ago and, uh, and this time the declaration has uh, one very, very important point that I'd like to underline, and it is the message, that uh, unanimous message from all the Arctic uh, states, ministers, and the permanent participants, uh, that uh, the Arctic is actually warming three times faster than the rest of the globe. And that is uh, what uh, really touches our, our interest. I mean, this is the very big important message that the arctic ministers agreed upon to forward to it's the rest of the world interesting because it kind of feels and it's also a message that was already clear two years ago and yeah. uh, it didn't might it through because of the opposition of the u.s government back in the days and i remember um the that happened um also after the speech of um state secretary pompeo um who actively uh, yeah, spoke up against Russia and China in the Arctic Council, which are, um, at least Russia as a, a full member, is a, a, a very important part in, um, in, yeah, in Arctic research, in uh, yeah, finding a common voice in Arctic uh, concerns. And that was a, a, a very interesting ministerial meeting. So after that, it, it went a little bit silent in, in public media for the Arctic Council, and that came back with the uh, Reykjavik Declaration. And that is, uh, that is really fantastic. And uh, actually, I think that uh, this might uh, also have been uh, a subject uh, of discussion between uh, the recent meeting between uh, President Biden and, uh, and President Putin, uh, because uh, the uh, North Atlantic and the uh, activities in the North Atlantic are of uh, strategic importance, not only, not only of social importance or climatic importance. Okay, second thing on our on our newsreel is from... We still don't have a jingle for that, right? No, we, we don't we have a, a newsreel jingle. We have to sooner or later. Dun, 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 dig, 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 dig. Some, some weird, <laughs> like someone playing the marimbas, the news marimbas, so maybe possible. Um, yes, the Barnes Observer has one that might be in Mario's ballpark, which is about... Pollutants in oceans, giants. It says blue whales and fin whales are the largest creatures on the planet. Human activities have posed challenges. Blah, blah, blah. And now they are threatened because of all the, pretty much all the schmutz in the, in the water, right? All the schmutz. Yes, <laughs> yes. And this is, this is actually really much into, uh, into what I'm, uh, I'm dealing with right now uh, with, my, with my present job. And, uh, and the authors here, especially Haley and uh, Haley Rotti and uh, Kit Kovacs and Christian Luderson are from the Polar Institute, the Norwegian Polar Institute. And uh, Haley is uh, working on pollutants in uh, marine, in life in the Arctic, but especially in uh, marine mammals and uh, seabirds. And um, they have uh, just uh, been approved for a project that uh, is going to sample marine mammal blubber. Uh, most of the pollutants that we are dealing with are uh, soluble here. in blubber. In the, and this is uh, uh, Christian Luderson is on the left there, and I can't really see who is the person holding the holding the crossbow and uh, taking so, a, so they are, a sample of a blue whale. They are not hunting. Whale. They are pretty much like uh, <laughs> ripping a little bit no. of blubber out of the. Well. Yes, and this is a this is a, a very well proven technique. Uh, it's uh, using a dart that is modified with a, a tip, like a, a a cylinder with a very sharp edge ah, open at the end, and uh, inside uh, this uh, cylinder tube there is a straightened uh, um, sea ho um, fishing hook. So with barbs that can retain the uh, the blubber and the skin. So the the dart is sent to the whale, and it actually penetrates for uh, five six centimeters the skin and the superficial blubber of the whale, and then bounces off, and it has a float, so it can be uh, taken back again. And then you unscrew the thing in the picture that you had above. You had a little uh, a little worm that is the blubber. Uh, carrot or the the uh, the you see there is a kind of That's a squiggle. That's a little tiny the, uh, sample compared to the size yeah. of a whale, right? 
exactly. And it's mm -hmm. taking, now these are uh, trying to take uh, quite a deep uh, sample of the blubber, but on a blue whale, you would have between 30, yeah, 25, 30, 35 almost, centimeters almost looks of, like one of thickness. These, these earth uh, drilling cores, right? Yes, that they exactly. Up. And then, of course, uh, taken back into the laboratory, you can do all sorts of uh, extractions and analysis to look for persistent organic pollutants, uh, for polyfluoro, biphenyls, and all these other yeah. nice things that uh, we have been pumping into the oceans. And because the whales are increasing in number, uh, we have, and luckily for that, but uh, we have to find out in their very long lifespan if these can affect, for example, the reproductive rates. And that is uh, that is one of the one of the points here. But they are also uh, environmental sentinels. So if the whales get a lot of pollutants in their blubber, it means that they there is blubber in their food in their environment, and uh, the North Atlantic is a big uh, chamber for uh, like a eating chamber. Like we can uh, see now how the EU and uh, Norway are fighting over cod quotas. And uh, yeah, so that means that means that, uh, <laughs> that that the project is is approved, and they can now go ahead and do some more serious yes. uh, science around around these. Yes, things. they can go and get uh, get samples over the next uh, couple of years and uh, make a, a uh, an extensive uh, mapping of the persistence of uh, these pollutants in in whales. All right, and it's last very interesting. Oh, sorry, um, go ahead. One, one more thing. It's very interesting, particularly in the light of. Um, the idea of whatever we put into the ocean gets diluted because the ocean is so vast and so big and everything just disappears. Um, I remember that um, when there was the uh, the accident in uh, Fukushima in the, uh, in the power plant and there was a long debate about um, yeah, just disposing the radioactive um, waste into the ocean because it just gets easily diluted there. And then you, you think about whales, um, blue whales, traveling quite some distance, uh, covering huge territory, huge ground, and then finding like yeah, those microparticles um, in their organism, and not only in their digestive tract, but really within their organism, within the blubber, uh, that's that's a very interesting um, fact, which poss possibly uh, just changes our understanding of how the ocean actually works. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's uh, it's uh, our organisms like uh, like blue whales that uh, travel long distances and that have long lifespans. They integrate uh, the. Uh, the environment, the data about the environment that they have uh, traveled and lived in. And uh, we have uh, problems like you were pointing out, the microplastics. That's another of the subjects that the uh, AMAP is, uh, is working on and is uh, coordinating work on. And that is uh, probably going to be some of the, in the, in some of the next uh, episodes, something about that. But, you know, until a few years ago, there was a saying, the solution to pollution is dilution, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, and the problem is that uh, if the dilution That, that should is... be the title for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh, must, yeah, we are diluting ourselves as well. If, oh, we, yes. if we get really many. <laughs> yeah. And and the problem is, of course, that when you have... Uh, uh, par when you when the concentrations increase and uh, of, of the pollutants, uh, we have, of course, uh, the pollutants coming back to us. Maybe not directly through the whales, but um, if the whales eat krill and there is also cod eating krill, and I am, I mean, this is <laughs> this is actually a soundtrack here. <laughs> this, it is quite gloomy what I'm saying, but uh, <laughs> but uh, it, like fish that we that comes into our, our fishmongers and supermarkets and mm. get, gets gets it back to us, delivers it back to us, and uh, that's not very nice, Indeed. to say the least. Yeah. All right. Getting to the soundtrack, I really have to say, when I moved from, from Iceland to Transylvania, um, that was the thing, or still is the thing that amazes me the, the most, because in Iceland, over all those years, I don't remember a single thunderstorm. And here you have them quite regularly, and I'm one of the very rare people who 
go outside when there's a thunderstorm just to look at it and just to feel it because it's just so amazing <laughs> for me. It's so awesome. <laughs> and the locals, they just, they just look at me and like, oh man, this, this guy's crazy. So everyone take a very close look at Henry because he might not be with us soon after he got hit by lightning. Yeah, exactly. <sighs> you, take your, you take your black cape on you and you go out in the Transylvanian forest <laughs> <laughs> in, a, in a thunderstorm. I can see that. Yeah. Let's, 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 yes. let's bring out all the stereotypes now. <laughs> <laughs> let's bring out <laughs> um, uh, hmm. third thing on our list of things is uh, ice related here's a tweet by the dg defis who is the defis d-f-i-s do we know that it's a very good question let me let me open their their bio and see because um the profile the eu commission directorate general for defense industry and space ah ha they are posting ah, okay there you go that's, bec that's because it's uh, copernicus so the same exactly thing exactly yeah, yeah, they, yeah they just um published the the picture or shared the picture here from uh copernicus from um from satellite network and they follow in an iceberg that is named d28 and i would like to remind us we talked quite a lot about an iceberg in the past year that was called A68. Yeah, I'm getting confused. You have to give us a bit of a map of the different icebergs now. A68 is history that we followed that for weeks. Then uh, A73 the in between. 74 was A74. the one that Polarstern has uh, circumnavigated from the Brunt ice shelf. And yes. now it's A76, which is currently the largest one in the ocean. Right. 4,700 square kilometer that carved off from the Rund ice shelf. And now we're talking here about D28, and you can see the number is slightly smaller than the A number. And what does the number say, Chris? What, what Do you remember? We talked um, about that once. Oh. The lower the number, the earlier it was found? I don't know. Is that chronological? Yes, the, those numbers are chronological, but the, the letters are um, also very important. So Antarctica is um, split into four quadrants, and depending on what ice shelf those icebergs are originating from, um, they get yeah, allocated to that quadrant um, and get the, the prefix of the ABCD. And we can here see that um, in the sector D, there is not much happening compared to, for example, A, which contains the uh, Fignoron ice shelf, uh, contains Larsen ice shelf, Brunt ice shelf. Um, there's quite some activity happening uh, because it's further... Um, yeah, well, it's not further north. It's not entirely true. The Antarctic Peninsula is with Larsen, but the Ron Fignor ice shelf is a, a, a very fast one, a fast-moving um, ice shelf there. And the Weddell Sea also has its own gyre, its own um, yeah, fast-flowing ocean current, which um, speeds things up. But in the D quadrant, we don't have that many... Um, accelerators and d28 actually carved in 2019 which is also a couple of years back but that iceberg is followed it's a, it's roughly 2000 square kilometers in size it's the one in the middle here in the picture so if you're just listening to the podcast just hop over to youtube and you get a idea of the satellite picture and what is so funny on this picture is the d28 which traveled very very slowly actually interacted with um, the ice shelves along Queen Maudland and here in fact caused the carving an active carving of a number of icebergs which you can see here as D30A D29A and C and so on so so there's a whole uh, bunch of them here on the screen exactly so yeah. D29 uh, uh, D28 actually um, yeah, caused D29 to calf and D30 and then they were also breaking apart into smaller pieces of particles and uh, if we look at the one that's on the left here now, uh, is it called B39? D39. No, it's B30. Is it B39? Oh, no, the one, the small one, B39. Yes. The small one is B39. So that's uh, that's an iceberg that actually came from the, uh, let's say, the Australian sector of uh, Antarctica, isn't it? It is, yes. And and went over and came into it's a visitor. the uh, west so of the Antarctic Peninsula. It's not the Australian sector. It's the, 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 Ross, um, the Ross Sea. And, it's a Ross Sea. And okay. Bellingshausen Sea. But still, okay. it's it's the opposite side, actually. It, it's the opposite side of Antarctica. So it traveled half away um, around Antarctica. And then it found, it found yeah. its brethren who are like 10 times bigger or more. 
<sighs> so. Yeah. Interesting, cool, new icebergs to follow. I like that. We should make this, mm. uh, we should have like charts who, who's in the lead and who's bigger and who's uh, broken up into more pieces. Um, or maybe not. So, uh, like I, People Magazine, just <laughs> Iceberg Magazine. Right. <laughs> um, so that is our Arctic newsreel. Um, and I, I kind of like this format already because there's all these different things that we have uh, that we can now talk about in addition to all the amazing things that we've talked about in the past. So I guess today we we'll, won't have like a big topic of any sort, um, but I think that's totally fine. And uh, I, but we're I'm working on it. I, I'm looking forward to to what uh, what this new dynamic here is gonna. Uh, gonna bring Same forward <laughs> this is pretty much going to be amazing so i guess with that let's end this episode a bit earlier than the others and uh let's see where this takes us um we are trying trying to be it's getting more difficult to schedule after um uh, with, with <laughs> additional people no it's 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 just a fact so cool. we might not always have episodes with uh, everyone on board uh, we might have different kinds of um, episodes with different kinds of uh, different kinds of oops pressing the wrong button here but that um, and now we're off bye bye everyone <laughs> bye bye <laughs> bye bye <laughs>